Our next speaker is Mark Spravak. He's also a fellow here at ICE with his wife, Michaela, and Edward, of course, is his son, who is a prodigy, you know, he's doing amazing things in Minecraft that uh, would defy all of you. Um, so Mark is a senior lecturer in philosophy at the School of Philosophy, Psychology, and Language Sciences at the University of Edinburgh. His primary research interests are in philosophy of mind and philosophy of science, with particular focus on the cognitive sciences. He's interested in building bridges between current philosophical work on cognition and the wider humanities. He did his PhD in 2006 at the University of Cambridge. He has been an academic visitor in Pittsburgh, Notre Dame, and Florence. He has been at the University of Edinburgh since 2011, where he is the current Director of Knowledge Exchange and Impact for the School of Philosophy, Psychology, and Language Sciences. Welcome, Mark. Thank, Thank you. you. That's great. Thank um, you. Great, and um, thank you very much indeed to, to Marcelo for, for inviting us and also for organizing um, this fabulous, fabulous conference. Um, so uh, this talk is gonna be trying to think a little bit about some of the issues which were raised in the Blind Spot um, article in the context of um, computational models of cognition. Um, so I'm actually gonna start, since um, my fellow speaker in this session is um, a Buddhist scholar, I'm gonna start with the Indian um, parable here. This, you guys have all, I'm sure, have all heard this. It's the, um, the blind man examining an elephant, and each one comes up with his own um, theory on what the elephant is. This guy says it's a wall, this guy says it's a rope, this guy says it's a fan. And um, <coughs> the way in which this parable is often presented is as a kind of a picture of human folly, um, of kind of what happens when, when science goes wrong. and um, you know, there are a variety of different depictions of it here. Um, I kind of like this one where the elephant is, is kind of laughing at the, at the guys also in this Mughal painting is laughing. It's like saying, you know, come on guys, I'm an elephant, you know, <laughs> can't you see? Um, now, I want to sort of think about this parable in a slightly different way to present a, a, di a different lesson for it, from it. So rather than as a picture of what as a picture of kind of failing, as a picture of what happens when science goes wrong. I'd, la I'd rather like to take this as a picture of kind of what happens when science goes right or what happens when science goes at least as well as one might expect it would. So I think that the lesson from the parable is that um, we should, as it were, um, try to um, trim our um, epistemic ambitions and think that um, the models that we construct in science are likely to be um, they don't have to be, but they're often likely to be, if we're dealing with a complex object, those models are likely to be partial, they're likely to be from particular perspectives, and they're likely to be relative to the interests of um, the folks who are building those models. Okay, so um, I, couldn't, I couldn't resist this, but I, I found, um, so this, this parable is uh, apparently, you know, this complete, um, this is way off my, my, my comfort zone, but, uh, the parable is often, uh, it, uh, I heard that it's been discussed in Buddhist scripture, so it's reported that the Buddha said, um, oh, how they cling and wrangle some who claim for preacher and monk the honored name, for quarreling each to his own view they cling, such folk only see one side of a thing. So I'm describing this picture here. But what I'd like to add to that is that that is entirely right, but I don't think that's any cause for pessimism, and sometimes it's a jolly good and reasonable thing to only see one side of an object. Okay, that's all by way of preamble. Let's um, get to the substance of the talk. So this is going to be about a view in philosophy of science called um, perspectivalism, and I'm going to be um, taking a fairly um, minimal understanding of perspectivalism, so I'm not gonna be going into some of the interesting issues with, about what commitments that you might have about the underlying metaphysics. I'm really going to understand it as the endorsement of a motto, which is that um, whenever you're exploring, whenever you're studying a specific domain in science, you should expect to find multiple models of the domain. That's not a, that's not a failing, that's not a transitory feature that's going to be washed out at the end of inquiry when you land on the one true model. You should expect to find multiple features, m multiple models of a domain in science. That's a, that, that, that's a feature, it's not a bug. 
Now, this is the connection to um, the work on the, 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 the blind spot. You don't just find multiple models at random. They're not just lots and lots of models for no good reason. Um, the right model, or a good model, is often one which is indexed in some way to um, the specific inquirer. And as we're going to see, inquirers have different interests and different purposes, so they're likely to need different models. And it's also going to be indexed not just to the interests and purposes of the inquirer, but also to the cognitive capacities of that inquirer as well. So we're limited cognitive agents in how we understand the world and um, the ways in which we can simplify the world, the ways in which we can fit the world into our limited capacity inside our heads. There are a variety of different choices about how to do that. Okay. So the inquirer is right at the center of what counts as a good model. You should expect multiple models, and those multiple models are relative to the interests and to the cognitive capacities of inquirers. Okay, so this talk is going to be, that's in, in, in kind of broad strokes what perspectivalism is, as a kind of a very general view in philosophy of science. This talk is going to be all about kind of going local and seeing what might it mean to be a perspectivalist specifically about computational modeling of cognition, okay? And part of the message from the talk is that the way in which um, these ideas about the observer being part of inquiry play out and um, they're going to play out in different ways in different scientific domains. So the claims I'm going to make, a lot of the claims are going to be specific to the case of computational modeling of cognition. And I think that's, that's kind of a, an interesting feature that the way in which the inquirer is embedded is going to play out in different ways. It's not just something which you can, you can give kind of a global um, account of. It's going to vary in different scientific domains. Okay. So this talk is going to try to, um, in a provisional <coughs> and programmatic way, try to answer that question. So just to give you a preview of what I'm going to say, um, so I'm going to argue that there are many ways in which to be a perspectivalist about computational modeling of cognition, the many ways in which the observer gets um, embedded into the model. And I'm going to argue that there are some which are more interesting than others. So I'm going to quickly run through three kind of trivial ways in which computational models of cognition are perspectival, and then I'm going to propose um, three kind of more contentious um, sub sub substantial ways in which um, such modeling is perspectival. Okay. Good. Okay, so a quick disclaimer. So um, for, about the purpose of this talk, so um, nothing I'm going to say is meant to convince you that you should drop all your existing views and adopt um, my view, okay? So the claims are not of the form, you should be a perspectivalist, you should uh, adopt this view in philosophy of science. Rather, what I'm going to try to do is articulate the view and say, well, if you were a perspectivalist, these are the sort of claims that you might defend, okay? So it's more about articulating the view than defending it. Okay. Great, so here is an um, overview of the talk. So I'm going to say something very briefly, um, all too briefly, about what, um, what would be an example of a computational model of cognition. Some of you guys are intimately familiar with these. Um, others, it might um, sound, sound a little strange to your ear. Um, then I'm going to um, try to characterize in a, a most minimal way as possible uh, what is perspectivalism as a general view. Um, and then the meat of the talk is really going to be about applying that um, general idea about perspectivalism to computational models of cognition and seeing the various ways in which the, the observer is going to get embedded into, uh, into what counts as a good, as, what counts as success as a good model. And then I'll make a few remarks by way of conclusion. Great. Okay, so on to the first, computational models of cognition. So this is the question which I always get asked at dinner parties, which I, I kind of hate. Uh, which is, um, what is a computational model of cognition? And uh, the reason why it is a really difficult question to answer, um, because there's um, very little um, which is kind of uncontroversial um, that you can say in answer to this question. Um, and that's particularly so if you're sympathetic to this kind of um, perspectivalist view in philosophy of science. So it's actually particularly hard to get for perspectivalists to give an answer to this question because they really don't want to put down a marker too early on what the specific goals, aims, and methods are of a computational model of cognition. They want to allow that there's going to be, there's going to be, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom. There are going to be a lot of different approaches. And I think that's the right thing. And I think if you open up um, journal papers in the literature, that's indeed what you find. Folks mean really quite different stuff by offering a computational model of cognition. 
Okay. Nevertheless, um, you want to say something to get at least into the right ballpark, for a kind of identify a rough indicative position from which you can then finesse kind of different perspectives or different specific views. And I think about the most that you can say really is that a computational model of cognition aims to, in some sense, uncover the computations behind our thought and behavior. And if you find that unsatisfactory, that is because it is unsatisfactory. It's a very um, anodyne description of it. Um, but I think that's pretty much as far as you can get in terms of the kind of agreed characterization of what such models are up to. And what we're going to see, hopefully, by the end of the talk is that there are a bunch of different ways, not always compatible, of how you kind of unpack this, how you unpack what the models are up to. Okay. Now, just not to leave you completely hanging here, um, I'll very briefly just mention kind of one example. So there's a vast literature with huge different, huge amount of variety in terms of different things people are doing with computational modeling of cognition. So I'll just give you one sample from an enormous and highly varied population. Um, and that's work on um, sensory cue integration. So suppose you're given a task, you have to um, work out which of, um, you're, you're given two ridges and you have to work out which of two ridges is higher than the other. Um, and you're presented this under three conditions. So under one condition, you can see the ridges, but you can't touch them. <coughs> under another condition, um, you can touch the two ridges, but you can't see them. Um, and under the third condition, you can use both sensory channels. So you can touch the ridges and you can also see them. Okay. Now it turns out whenever they study people's, how people um, can make judgments under those conditions, uh, that is that um, what people do in the third condition when they have access to both sensory modalities, vision and touch, is that they weigh the evidence from those different modalities in line um, with the Bayesian calculus. So they seem to implement some form of Bayesian inference. So they weigh them in terms weighted by their uncertainty about um, the individual sensory channels. So in some sense, which remains to be unpacked and which there's lots of interesting work in the philosophical and in the, the empirical literature, in some sense that remains to be unpacked, the brain is implementing some form of Bayesian inference in these cases in sensory cue integration. Okay. So that's just you know, one, one example of a claim people have made about how a computation might be behind a specific piece of thought or behavior. Okay, I'm aware that we're running a little bit late, so I don't want to spend too much time on, 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 on kind of the examples. So let me get on to um, the characteristics of the, of the general view and how we should think about these kind of models. Okay, so what is this um, view, which I think is quite helpful, perspectivalism? Well, it starts from, uh, I think, a very um, commonsensical observation, which is kind of one of the you know, few agreed data points which comes out of any kind of work on the history or sociology of science, and that's to think of science and scientific inquiry not as some sort of highly abstract activity, but as a concrete process that's carried out by actual human beings in the world who are interacting with each other via social institutions, they have to communicate, they have to coordinate their activities, and they're really seeking to find their way in a complex world to achieve a variety of different ends, okay? So it's a fairly um, trivial observation, but I think it's a powerful one, and I think it's a, you know, it's a well-supported well -supported one. So what this gives us is um, reasons to have certain expectations about what would count as a good scientific model. And it explains why, whenever you actually look at scientific practice, why you rarely find a single model of a particular domain in science. So one of the reasons why you rarely find a single model is that um, different inquirers are trying to find their way in a complex world. Those different inquirers might have very, very different aims. So they might want to predict different things about that single domain. They might want to control for different kinds of variables about that single domain. And they might have different standards for accuracy. Um, about their predictions in that single domain, um, and so forth. So there's a variety of different purposes to which one wants to use a model. You want to take the model and do something with it, and different people want to do radically different things, okay? And some models are better for certain purposes than others. Okay, so you should expect that there can be a variety of different models to suit our variety of different purposes or things we would like to do with the models. 
Secondly, um, the world is really, really complex. Most scientific domains are super complex. And given our cognitive limits, you know, we're, we're limited agents in terms of the models we can entertain in our heads, and given our observational limits, it's often kind of hard to make observations in the world, um, we have to simplify. So we have to come up with idealized models of specific domains. And often there are a variety of different ways in which you can make those choices about idealizing a complex world. So often there's scope for variation there. Okay. So the motto is really, um, going into inquiry, I think it's reasonable to expect that there's going to be variation in scientific models. You should expect that there are going to be multiple good models um, of the same domain, because there's variation in what you subsequently might want to do with the model, and um, there's variation in the kinds of idealizing assumptions which might be appropriate for that domain. Okay. Now, just because there could be variation, or just because you know, you might think it's likely that there's going to be variation given the variation in our aims and our, our limited capacities. Doesn't mean that there has to be variation. So it could be that you get lucky and that a specific domain could be a very small, simple portion of the world. It might turn out to have really just one good model of that. That model is good for all our purposes. It serves us for, you know, predicting whatever we want to predict, plugging into anything else. We can achieve anything we want with it and it might not require any idealization, or there might be kind of only one reasonable way in which to idealize. Okay, so that's certainly possible. It's certainly something which I don't think needs to be ruled out. Um, I guess I struggle to, you know, perhaps there's certain domains in physics which are like that. Um, so I think it was mentioned earlier uh, in the talks yesterday, the, the example of the Galileo pendulum, which is, the, you know, one case where you think, oh yeah, you know, you've got a really good model of that, and you know, that's all you need, and then you can predict all the all the things that we want to know about the pendulum. But I think that that seeing that is kind of the exception rather than the than than, than the rule. So I think that our initial credence going into inquiry um, should be fairly low that there's going to be one single domain which is going to do one single model which is going to do it all for us, because it would require in a way a kind of a remarkable fit, three-way fit between the world our interests and our cognitive capacities. And I think that going into inquiry, there's no reason to expect um, that the world is gonna be simple and graspable by our minds and um, produce a model which is usable for all our purposes in just the way required. And I think that whenever you move to domains which are um, acknowledged on many different measures as, as extremely complicated, so whenever you're starting to look at things in the special sciences or in, in psychology, then I think it's you know, your credence should be extremely low that there's going to be one single model which is going to do it all um, for us. It's going to provide all of our um, explanatory goods and predictive goods. Even at the end of inquiry, I think it's extremely unlikely that um, we, should, we, should, we should put a high credence to that. Maybe we might be lucky, but maybe not. Okay, so those of you who um, have come across this literature will know that a lot of time is spent on this worry about inconsistent models. So it seems reasonable to expect that um, the various good ways of modeling the world, they might be consistent with each other, but then they might not. Um, and often many of the examples which are given of rival models of a single domain are actually not um, literally logically consistent with each other. And people worry a great deal about this and they think, is this a threat to realism and so forth? Um, so I'm not gonna spend a huge amount of time on this worry. Um, so I think that um, you do see inconsistent models in uh, computational modeling practice. So just to take kind of a really simple example. So you might take a, 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 a simple electronic computer like this and uh, you might model it as computing the addition function. Okay, so that's one of the models that computational scientists might use to model what it's doing, or you might model it as computing just a finite portion of the addition function, okay? Because there's, there's certain numbers which if I put that into it, it will give me the wrong answer, it won't be able to give me an answer. It can't compute the entire extent of the addition function. <coughs> now, both of those models can't be true. It can't be computing the whole addition function, and it can't be computing just a finite portion of the addition function. But I don't kind of lie awake at night worrying that, oh, my computer instantiates these inconsistent properties that, you know, it's both computing the whole addition function and not computing the whole addition function. No, I think that um, modelers understand that 
there are certain conditions under which one model is appropriate to use and is correct for achieving our ends, and there are other conditions under which you set that aside and you pick up another model. So I don't think it's anything necessarily worrying about finding models which, if you write them down, look like they are literally inconsistent because those models may hang together in some looser sense, and provided the modelers understand the conditions under which you apply them, under which you switch from one to the other, there's no reason to um, understand that there's a massive threat to realism or serious threat to realism here. Okay, so that's a, it's a really interesting set of issues here, but I'm just gonna, I'm, I'm gonna move on to the time being. I just want to flag that I don't think that that's, that's a massive worry. So just to briefly summarize, so a minimal version of perspectivalism is gonna say that what counts as a good scientific model of a specific domain is relative in part um, to one's perspective. Okay, so this perspective of the agent doing the modeling. And perspectives are at least a part in function of what we want to do with the model, what our aims are, and also with the compromises we elect to make in idealizing and taking the quart of the world and kind of pouring it into the pint pot of our heads when we, when we try to model and try to understand and explain the world. And I think that going into inquiry, it's, it's, it's reasonable to expect that there's likely to be variation with these two. And I think if you look at sociology of science, history of science, then you find that there is massive variation with these. So I think it's reasonable to expect that they're gonna be likely good models of a single domain. Okay, so I hope that that doesn't sound massively controversial to you. It's, supposed, it's not supposed to, it's supposed to be acceptable to even the most hard-nosed um, realist. Um, but I think it provides a useful way of helping to understand um, disagreements and um, seemingly intractable disagreements about computational modeling in cognitive science. So let's get on to that. Okay, so how does this play out in this realm? Well, first of all, I want to just quickly run through kind of three very, um, very anodyne senses in which computational models of cognition are perspectival. You find these very, very commonly endorsed in the literature, so hopefully um, no one should um, kind of have any qualms about them. So the first is, is that it's a very common point which is made, multiple disciplines build computational models of cognition. So it's a kind of an interdisciplinary area and um, you find models built, of co computational models of cognition built in psychology, computer science, neuroscience, psychiatry, molecular biology, economics, social science, evolutionary theory. And the thing that you notice is that they don't use, they don't all use the same model. Okay. So researchers in these different disciplines often have very, very different interests even though they're studying, in a sense, the same target system, they're interested in explaining and predicting different types of effects, different properties of that system, and often they will be, you know, construct different models, different computational models of those systems to answer different questions, and they'll often idealize cognition in different ways. Okay. So that's one way in which um, the interests and the cognitive capacities of the uh, researchers are going to enter into what counts as a good model and what counts as a good model is gonna depend on the discipline which is studying the target system. Second kind of trivial way in which it comes in is that, um, again, a common point which is made, um, researchers even in the same discipline often model cognition at different scales, different spatial scales from molecular processes, single cells, computational properties of single neurons, small numbers of neurons, neural populations, whole networks, whole brains, all the way up to entire agents or groups of agents. And researchers are often um, looking at, different researchers often look at different scales. So they might be given a computational model of develop, developmental processes, of um, long-term learning processes, skills and automaticity those kinds of um, learning processes, or short-term learning, the kinds of um, uh, things that Peter was talking about there, whenever you are able to acquire a new piece of information, you know, very, very quickly, or kind of on-the-fly inference, actually being able to apply what you know to a, to a given scenario. And again, um, you often find um, different models for um, these um, uh, processes at different scales, really quite different computational models. Um, so one of the interesting things which has happened in the literature which people are reacting against is that um, predictive processing has proposed this view 
that there's one computational model which kind of works across all these temporal scales. But that's kind of really, really unusual. Most people think that um, there's going to be quite different computational models um, of, of, of brain activity at, 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 at all sorts of different scales. OK. So the third and um, slightly more interesting um, or unusual um, way in which um, computational modeling is, you should already agree that it's perspectival, is um, articulated by David Marr in his um, three different levels of um, computational description. So Marr said, whenever you propose a computational model of cognition, you might be trying to do one of three quite different things. So you're still focusing on exactly the same target system, but your model is trying to explain three different types of things. So you might be proposing a computational model, what he calls a computational model, which is a description of what function, what overall function, what input output behavior the system exhibits. So what mathematical function is being computed by that system. Um, you might be proposing the model as an algorithmic model of that system. So here the model is telling you not just about the function being computed, but, but the process by that system is computing the function, how it actually computes the function. It's telling you in some sense about the mechanism, about how it's being computed. Or you might be proposing a computational model as a story about implementation. You might be proposing it as a um, story about how um, individual steps in an algorithm in an abstract algorithm map onto the nuts and bolts of the neural hardware. And you often find in the, in the literature that um, whenever researchers propose a computational model, they'll say, hey, my model is a MAR computational level model, or it's only a MAR algorithmic level model. It's not a story about implementation. So they'll often say exactly kind of what questions, what specific questions they want to answer about that target system. OK, good. Right. So let me move on and talk about the super contentious stuff. So these are the less obvious ways in which computational models of cognition are indexed. Not just They're not just getting it right about the system. They're getting it right about the system relative to a set of explanatory and predictive questions that an observer might have. OK. So the first is that um, different inquirers or different observers might have different perspectives on what the task is that the cognitive system is solving or the part of the cognitive system is solving. So it's one of the kind of core postulates of cognitive psychology is that cognition doesn't just come in kind of one monolithic thing. So it seems to us, if we kind of introspect on the inside, it, does, it seems to be, doesn't seem like clearly articulated, but cognition doesn't come in order for cognitive psychology to work at all, um, you have to assume that you um, divide up cognition, you segment cognition into discrete capacities. So these capacities might be perception, uh, memory, attention, or they might be lower level capacities about um, detect ability to detect various edges in the scene, or to be able to infer um, shape from shading and so forth. So cognition should be segmented into discrete capacities. And the way in which you individuate the capacities is extensionally by the tasks that those capacities accomplish. Okay? So you say what specific task that capacity aims to do. So for perception, you might characterize the task as taking in an array of um, light intensity and yielding on the outside um, a 3D model of the world. Okay? That might not be the right way to characterize the task of perception but that's the way in which some folks have characterized the task of perception. So if you're in this game at call, you've got to divide up cognition into distinct tasks. And what more computational level models do is they provide a kind of a formal language for doing that. And they give a description of what these tasks are. So the task that a given cognitive capacity um, accomplishes is characterized by the mathematical function that it computes on these computational, if you're adopting these kind of computational approaches. So computation provides a formal language for characterizing what the tasks are. Okay, so that's all great, but how do we do this? So how do we segment cognition, which is this kind of mess of activity, into um, discrete tasks? Um, so this is a really, really hard question. In, um, cognitive psychology is something which causes a great deal of anguish. Um, it's very much in kind of in 
an, 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 an open issue. And there are various kind of proposals which people have about starting from various assumptions. So you might think, oh, well, we'll start from maybe folk psychology and the ways in which cognition is divided into tasks and capacities in folk psychology and finesse it from there. Or we should start maybe from evolutionary psychology and think what are the tasks which based our you know, early evolutionary ancestors. And those are the ways in which we should segment current um, cognitive psychology. Or we might be able to do something bottom up by looking at uh, neuroscience and being able to kind of group together bits of neural activity and maybe we can segment tasks that way. Okay. Now, I, what I'd like to suggest what, that a perspectivalist might add to this or might, might, might uh, per suggestion that they might provide is um, to say, well, you know, why think that there's just one good way of segmenting cognition up into tasks? Or why think, you know, in a way that should strike you as a slightly funny question to ask. So you might wonder, well, is this really just a fact about the world? You know, is there a correct, single correct way of segmenting cognition up into tasks? Or does it really make sense whenever we're asking this question, we're asking that question relative to something that we want to explain, okay? So what a perspectivalist might suggest is that, look, we should expect that there are multiple good ways about doing this, depending on the interests and cognitive limitations of the observers. So there's not just kind of one good way of taking the mass of behavior and chopping it up into little, into little parcels. What counts as a good way of taking the mass of behavior and chopping it up into little parcels is relative to what you want to then do with the model, what you want to explain with the model, what you want to predict with the model. Okay. So perspectivalists might suggest that there are multiple, you should expect variation in the task descriptions in computational modeling. So different task descriptions are going to group together and idealize behavioral complexity, the mass of good behavioral complexity in different ways. And why going into inquiry should we think that there's just one universally good way of doing this? There might be, you know, that's perfectly compatible with perspectivalists, there might be, but there doesn't need to be. Okay? So a good task description a good way of segmenting cognition into separate capacities and tasks is partly indexed to what we want to do with that model, what we subsequently want to explain with that model, and how we're willing to idealize. And different researchers can legitimately differ about this. And I think we actually see this occurring right now um, in various bits of the literature, which unfortunately um, I don't have the, have the time to, 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 to go into. So I think that we should expect room for variation here. It's not a zero-sum game that there's only one kind of correct way of segmenting cognition into capacities and tasks. Okay, so I'm just keeping, keeping an eye on the time here. So the, um, the second kind of controversial thing I'd like to say is that um, if a perspectivalist might suggest that there are gonna be different perspectives on what the algorithm is, what the what the, um, what the abstract process is that is behind um, the cognitive capacity. Now, one of the striking things whenever you open up um, journal papers in the literature is just the massive diversity um, of different types of algorithms which are um, used to model um, cognition. So, you know, you find connectionist networks, classical symbol processing, lots and lots of Bayesian approaches, Within these approaches, there are lots and lots of different network topologies. There are lots and lots of primitive um, operations, oper computational operations, which are taken as primitive, and then you build up the process from there. There's huge amount um, of variation. And um, all of these different families of algorithms are distinct from each other. They're proposing different processes behind how um, cognition is, um, is produced. Um, but they are all, in a way, equally powerful. So they're all Turing complete in that they could all um, be made to fit um, with the data. And again, you get um, kind of very, very heated disagreement about which is the true computational architecture of cognition, which is the correct algorithmic family to use to model cognition. Okay? So should we model it as classical symbol processing? Should we model it as Bayesian inference? What's the true computational architecture? A perspectivalist, I think, can usefully suggest that um, there doesn't need to be a single winner in this. So there may be multiple good families of algorithms for modeling cognitive processing about, different, about which different researchers may legitimately <coughs> differ. Again, the question about what is the true algorithmic family um, to use to model cognition, it could again 
should strike you as a slightly funny um, question to, to, to ask. It's going to depend exactly on which effects one wishes to explain, and certain effects are better explained um, by certain processing models than others. Okay, so to take an example from the recent literature, um, papers from the past 10, 15 years, a lot of the computational models, the algorithmic computational models of cognition were Bayesian models, so they had something like a Bayes network, and they viewed the cognitive processes operating in some process of inference over that Bayes network. But if you open up papers which are appearing um, right now, then you get a different family of algorithms which are proposed to model often the same cognitive processes, and these are um, deep neural networks, so these are models which are inspired by current work in AI and machine learning. Um, so these two models are different. These are two completely different families of algorithm. Um, and you're getting this kind of anguished debate at the moment about which is the right family of algorithm to use to model a certain cognitive process. Should we be modeling as, with this Bayesian process or as a deep neural net? I think the perspective list can usefully suggest that the two families just may be good for explaining different purposes. There doesn't need to be one objective answer about what is the true computational architecture. Um, the two families might be good for different ends. So this is exactly, again, what happened, you know, if you wind back time a little bit to the debate about whether um, we should allow for classical symbol processing models or whether we should have connectionist networks, so the simpler connectionist networks in those days. So back to the 80s and 90s, there were again anguished debates about that. And those debates have kind of disappeared. And the reason why they've disappeared is that not because any one of these two models have disappeared and the one is one out over the other, it's that folks who are interested in certain effects end up using classical symbol processing models and folks who are interested in explaining other effects um, produced by the brain are um, using other types of models. Sometimes, um, so if they're interested in certain types of learning or resistance under degradation, um, to the neural system, then they often are interested in neural network models. So again, expect variation. It depends on what you want to explain and which role aspects you want to idealize away. So the perspective list should say that you should expect variation in the family of algorithm used in computational modeling. So that's not to say that anything goes, you can use anything you like. So the model should be simple. It should be empirically accurate, it should produce the, the right results, the measured results, and it should support the kinds of inductive inferences that we want to, to draw, so it should be robust under the kinds of variation that we're interested in and control for the right kinds of variables. And, um, but given this, there may well be one, more than one candidate, so there may be more than one um, computational architecture which is good for explaining um, what, we're, what we're interested in. Okay, so very briefly, and on to the final point here. So I think a natural reaction to um, the suggestion that we say, well, which process model do you use, which algorithm you use is really relative to your, your interest and what effects you want to explain. A natural reaction is to say, well, look, there's just an objective fact of the matter about which algorithm the brain is running. You just look at what's running at the kind of the base level in the neural hardware. So you might want to think about an electronic PC and think, well, there's an objective fact of the matter about which program it's running right now. And you just look at the base hardware and you see, okay, this, um, this junction here has a potential of five volts, this junction here has a potential of zero volts. That's a zero, that's, that's a one. And then you kind of build, build, build it up, build up um, what, the, what the actual objective algorithm is from there. So which al why, don't we, why don't we just say the same thing for the brain? We just we don't know it yet, but we need to um, try to find out what at the base level um, the brain is really running. I think that um, the comparison here between brains and electronic PCs is, is very misleading. So brains are um, in many ways very different from electronic PCs. And one of the big differences is that electronic PCs have um, one intended um, computational implementation. So we design them that way, we engineer them that way, so that there is only one program or the only one algorithm that they're running. You know, that's, we do that because it's there, you know, that's incredibly useful for us to do. But there's absolutely no reason to think that um, brains are like this. So brains are phenomenally complicated physical systems where there's a lot of physical activity going on, and it's not at all evident looking from outside of that system how to group together bits of that physical activity into discrete computational states. 
So I think that we should allow for the possibility that there are going to be multiple good ways of doing this. There are going to be multiple good ways of grouping together the raw physical activity into um, discrete computational states in the brain. Now, this question of, well, what algorithm is the brain really running? What computation is it really performing? There's been a lot of good philosophical work which has been done on that. And these co this comes under the heading of um, theories of implementation. And these theories, these philosophical theories, try to answer the question, well, if you encounter a natural system like a brain or, um, or, an or, 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 or you know, whatever natural system you encounter, um, what's the correct way of grouping physical states in that system um, into um, computational states? So there have to be some constraints on it. Um, so if you don't allow any constraints, then there's a very elegant result by Hilary Putnam which shows that you get a triviality result. You get that virtually any physical system implements any computation. So there have to be some constraints. So what are they? What is the right way of um, grouping together physical states and natural systems onto computational states? And there are basically, this is oversimplifying, but there are basically four um, main proposals um, in the literature. Um, so the bad news is that none of these proposals work. Um, they're, they're all very ingenious, but uh, none of them work. So, um, so Tyler Burge and Tim Crane and myself and many other people have defended the idea that the right way of grouping st physical states together is in terms of shared representational content. So states with shared representational content should map onto the same computational state. While Chero Piccinini has defended the idea that the right way of grouping physical states in the brain is in terms of their natural teleological function. Um, Dave Chalmers has defended the idea that you group them together depending on having the same causal role, even though they might be very physically different from each other. And Peter Godfrey Smith has a wonderful paper where he argues that the way in which we should group them together is in terms of their first order physical similarity, so states that are phys physically similar and their you know, first order physical properties are ones that should fall under the same computational state. Okay. Now, none of these work, and um, the reason why they don't work is kind of interesting in, in that they often work for some cases, but not others, and they often fit many cases of scientific practice, but they dramatically fail in other cases. Um, so it seems that certain ones, certain proposals here kind of accurately match what scientific modelers are doing in certain circumstances, and other proposals match what they're doing in other circumstances. So I think that the right way to think about these, or what the perspectivalist might suggest, is that, you know, why choose only one of these? So there might be multiple good ways of grouping um, physical states in the brain into computational states. There doesn't need to be just one good answer to that. So we should expect that there's going to be variation in the models about how neural implementation works, and that's not a bug, it's a feature. Okay. So the right way is not some objective feature about the brain. It's partly indexed to what we want to do with the computational model and how we're willing to idealize. And different researchers may differ about that, and they might adopt different accounts of neural implementation as a result. So there's room. I think that we should at least allow space for room for legitimate variation. OK, so very briefly, by way of conclusion, so I think that perspectivalism is, is useful in that it offers a way to think about disagreements which can often be very heated and anguished in, in science. And um, the three ones which I mentioned are, are particularly fraught. So it offers ways to think about how we divide up cognition into discrete tasks, about which family of algorithm, whether a Bayesian algorithm, whether a neural network algorithm, whether a classical symbol processing algorithm, which family of algorithm is the right one to describe cognitive processing. You don't need to choose um, just one. It's going to depend on what your, what your purposes are. And on how we address this fraught question of how you map um, raw brain activity onto computational states in your model. There might be multiple stories, might multiple good stories about how that's done, and they don't need to all be um, all match. OK, so the perspectivalist contribution is that whenever you see such disagreements, they don't need to be a zero-sum game, which is kind of often the default assumption in this bit of the literature, at least, anyway. And the right computational model is indexed not just to the way the brain is or the way the world is in this case, but what we want to do with the world. Well, sorry, what we want to do with the model and how we choose to simplify. And I think that, you know, for me, anyway, this chimes at least some of the things that, um, that, that, was, that was in the, in the wonderful Aeon article. 
And I think it indicates a blind spot between participants in disagreements in computational modeling, um, that in fact they appear to, to disagree, but they don't really disagree, and um, they just kind of want to extend their, their instances of legitimate variation. And um, I've run over, so thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, <clears throat>